Thanks. Very warm welcome to our conference. I'm so glad that we can meet here again. And thanks to all of you who have traveled shorter and longer distances to be here today with us. And I'm also glad that this conference is done in cooperation uh, with Masaryk University in Brno. And I would like to welcome also those of you who came through this cooperation. And before uh, we start the program, I will just give the microphone also to Jiří, the vice rector of the university, but don't hold it against him. Uh, and uh, Jiří may say just a couple of words as well. Thank you very much, dear colleagues, dear friends. I would like to greet you on behalf of the Brno organizers and participants. And I am glad that we can meet here in a nice place. It is a mandatory sentence, but it sounds different nowadays. Uh, live meeting has become a joyful experience thanks to COVID. That's one thing, and uh, the other is created by a, a completely new situation due to the war in Ukraine. We just changed many of our values and priorities. Yeah, the COVID pandemic and the war are certainly in direct opposition to our topic, to the topic of our meeting. COVID is not beautiful, and war is certainly not beautiful. It would almost seem that our theme is almost inappropriate. Perhaps we should talk more about pain, suffering, human misfortune. It is also for this reason that I would like to explain that we chose the theme of beauty with Ivana, last holiday, under the beautiful blue Greek sky. It seems to us at the time that the COVID uh, would not return and the idea of Russia invading Ukraine did not even cross our minds. So uh, yet we want to talk about beauty even for three days, perhaps one could say that this is in spite of the reality we live in. And in fact, I think that talking about beauty is always in spite of, just as in spite of is or can be a theme of goodness or truth. I wanted to wish you useful and beautiful days. Today I'm looking forward to the other lectures, to the discussions, maybe to the exhibition tomorrow. I wish you all a nice evening and enjoyable stay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yeshi. I was missing one hand for the clapping but this is always a still different move here that we always miss something. And like what Jiří said, I think the theme of beauty and the role of beauty and being and becoming human, uh, I think can help us maybe to dig deeper into something that renews life, something that we need in the times of crisis, perhaps even more. I will have the introductory lecture, which would be a little bit longer than planned, because unfortunately our anthropology colleague didn't make it today. So I will try to sit on one chair, <laughs> but representing two really. Uh, on the role of beauty in understanding of the human self, of the transcendence and of what is and what is not holy. So I will be starting from the theological perspective and perhaps also from the uh, perspective of practiced religiosity. For me, there would be a very personal question behind my reflection. When I was preparing for the talk, I was wondering, why is it that beauty has been so important in my art and so little reflected in my theology? 
and I think it took me back to many years ago why I had very complicated relationship to theological aesthetics. And as I was preparing this lecture, I was trying to work through that. The first thing I want to mention is the conflicts that also make who we are. And for me, theologically, this would be the conflicts with a heritage of simplified concepts, where the transcendent and the holy was at stake. Beauty was in the setting where I started to learn theology, yet another form of conformity to what is claimed to be its ideal form. I would not call this Platonism, because Platonism is deeper and broader, but this would be perhaps the populist version of that, which was well spread that time and perhaps even today. It came up with the idea that there is only single way of the beautiful, that it is non-contextual, static, identified by those who have superior right to define universally valid aesthetics. And sometimes it saddens me that I see it till now that the aesthetical theories which are around and which are around in theological faculties would still follow similar schemes. It would be inspired by the mentality of copying, by classics being treated as sketch or as an idol. And this, I think, inspires protests. We can see these protests much longer time in the art. The art, in the art, there is a long history of opposing such notions of beauty and many attempts to stimulate human growth towards authenticity, expanded perception, playfulness, maturity, or depth. Here you have just a couple of examples of that, but I'm sure that each one of us know many more of these. I had one missing hand, but I will try to cope. So, how was beauty in theology then experienced by my generation? A way backward or a protest, touching upon the very sources of the human growth, personal and collective. Again, in the churches when we sing hymns sometimes, we may keep wondering why infantility of some of the ecclesial aesthetics is still making its way to theology why copying the long lost imagined golden ages is still popular. Still, there is little practical understanding of the power of symbolic mediation, little awareness of how long ago some of the classical theological symbols practically died, even for Christians. In, when, myself and many others when we accompany retreats, which this place also reminds me of last time I had a seminar here on Monday with people. Uh, you see how much you have to translate even basic concepts like redemption or salvation. Even people who come from the ecclesial background, it doesn't say anything to them. Or try sin. It would just produce I think the heavy baggage for people. And in theology, we are stuck to those, like beetles spinned on the wall quite often. Still there is little awareness, as Gustav Mahler says, that tradition is the preservation of fire, not the worship of ashes. But there has been also some more serious attempts to rehabilitate the classical approaches. And uh, uh, when I was preparing, uh, I had to work at least a little bit with Hans Urs von Balthasar and his project of theological aesthetics. I have never been a Balthasarian and after that work I haven't become one. But I think it deserves to be fairly represented. Uh, Balthasar goes back to Aquinas and uh, he works with the interaction between form and light. 
Beauty can be grasped in its materiality, says Balthazar, as harmony in the laws of being, including its numerical, logical, ethical dimensions. It could be grasped by concepts, including truth and value. When I meet with natural scientists, for example, or mathematicians who are friends of mine, uh, they would still from the very best be inspired by these ideas. When dealing with the beautiful, Balthazar says, we never leave the form behind in order to plunge into the transcendent depths. The divine is always sacramentally mediated as enfleshed. When I read these lines, I wonder who were the people and the approaches he needed to protest against. What were the simplified ideas he couldn't stand? They were different from mine, and therefore also there were different conclusions. Balthazar says, the form appears beautiful only because the delight it arouses in us is found upon the fact that in it the truth and goodness of the depths of reality itself are manifest and bestowed. And this manifestation and bestowal reveal themselves to us as being something infinitely and inexhaustibly valuable and fascinating. The form is so, so important to Balthazar. And he says that we never leave this behind when we go to the depths. He repeats this again and again. Perhaps in the same way I repeat my protest. This is a funny quote. Uh, and uh, I have to thank, like for a number of other things, the Geza Tyson, who is here with us, uh, because uh, I found this quote again in your uh, reader uh, of theological aesthetics. So some, somebody smaller is talking to somebody bigger now. Thank you for that. Protestant aesthetics has wholly misunderstood this dimension, meaning the importance of form. Locating then the total essence of beauty in the event in which the light interrupts. And then he says that Protestants were right about something. But the fact that Protestants just could not appreciate the value of the form was something which Balthazar considered as completely mistaken. But he works within the vocabulary which today even many Catholic theologians would found outdated. For example, Louis-Marie Chauvet, Jean-Luc Marion, and many others. But I think what he tried to look at was the importance of embodied and the importance of tradition, which is usually much richer, even the tradition of beauty is much richer than we would get it, give it a credit. Here are my two heroes who are not Protestants, but Jewish. So it means that they would be still a little bit more radical. I probably better find the paper so that I don't make things up. Theodor Adorno, uh, his work, The Aesthetic Theory, uh, which was published only uh, post-mortem, uh, spells out that uh, it's not beauty which is the main category of aesthetics, but truth is the foundational category. He goes back to his Jewish roots and especially to forbidding of idolatry. And he says that idolatry includes also conceptual schemes such as primordial harmony or even ecstatic presence. A relationship to reality that is wild and messy is what is so important for him, not a replacement. Generalizations and cliches lead people towards conformity. Kitsch is the lack of truth, not the lack of beauty. It is a copy, not an original. There is no engagement with the real. 
And when he speaks about the art that he likes, he would speak, for example, about the Cubist painting. Because in a Cubist painting, you can see reality from different sides at the same moment. You can see a vase from the top, from the side, from the bottom. Or a cacophonic music that doesn't want to harmonize and to exclude the marginalized voices. I love this photograph of both of them. And here you have Emmanuel Levinas, another Jewish thinker, who would say, it's not the beauty, it is justice. Levinas speaks a lot about the face of the other, which is foundational for us being human. We do not have our human identity in our interior lives, not in the self, but in our response to the other, especially the other that is needy. Again, the Jewish inspiration, the widow, the orphan, the stranger. Thou shall not kill. And the killing for Levinas doesn't mean only the physical act of murder, even if that as well, but it means also depriving the other from his or her voice, from his or her difference. And when Lavina speaks about the face that comes as an epiphany, as a revelation of the other, he says that it is not the beauty of the face, but it is the requirements of doing justice to the other. So here we have aesthetics which comes on different lines, truth and justice. These two people have been very influential on me, but I think I also need to say with them and critical to them whether it is all that there is. Beauty is not the primary category of aesthetics, but what if the aesthetics is not the primary place of beauty? What if beauty is not a value outside? What if it is outside of the business exchange? What if it is not an ideal either? What if it is outside of the conformity demand? What if the beauty is not reducible even to truth and justice? If there is different fullness, which the others do not contribute to what it means to be good. Again, one example which I have discovered thanks to Geza, a Protestant theologian of the last century, Paul Tillich, who uh, during the World War I worked as a military chaplain. And he experienced a double breakdown during that period, existential estrangement from the convictions and the values formed by his upbringing, from religious faith that carries them as well. The proximity of the meaninglessness of suffering and death led to very profound crisis for him. And in that time, an encounter with beauty was for him something that touched deeper than that which was lost. In a small piece of writing, which is called One Moment of Beauty and which he published first time in 1950, he speaks about uh, going uh, to the small bookshops which were available on front. Uh, and uh, you could get very cheap uh, prints there, and once he got a hold of Botticelli's Madonna with singing angels, which you can see on the picture. And through that, he had perhaps a similar experience that uh, Bulgakov, when he had to flee Russia, uh, had when he was for the first time in Hagia Sophia, seeing the divine wisdom there. Tillich says, Something of the divine source of all things came through to me. That moment has affected my whole life. 
given me the keys for interpretation of human existence. It has brought vital joy and spiritual truth. What is interesting here actually, that this example would not fit to the scheme which Balthazar was speaking about. There is no split between the light and the form here. And Tillich then would speak about being actually brought much closer to the wealth of the symbolic tradition, which was broader than his Protestant tradition. It has expanded his horizon and the influence which lasted his lifetime included that too. But it is interesting that Tillich doesn't speak here about the aesthetical, but about the beautiful. And this is a different speech. And this is also a different speech. Sorry about the mess. Polyev Dokimov uh, would be the next author I want to look at for inspiration. Polyev Dokimov, in his work, The Art of the Icon, says that it's interesting that in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Bible, which was for the most of the church fathers, really the Old Testament they read, because most of them, they didn't read Hebrew. They had access to the text only in translation. Uh, in the creation narrative, in the younger one, which opens the Bible, and when you have it like a liturgical hymn that God creates, uh, the plants, the creatures, and then the human being. It says, and God saw that it was good. This is what we are used to that. But in the Septuagint, God saw that it was beautiful. Kalon rather than Agathon. And if you think of that in these terms, different language gives you slightly different perspective. The Kalon means beautiful, it means also in some sense good. Uh, I didn't bribe the authors, but it also means noble. <laughs> but I got the name only by adoption, so I don't have any claim to that. No. But I think the beauty and joining the beauty right to the beginning of God's act is something which can open for us the new door. And Yevdokimov also speaks about the need to discern different forms of beauty. The beauty that leads to fulfillment of creation and thus also to a human life, for him goes back to the insights taken from Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky knew suffering from first-hand experiences. As a young man, oh, I have the information here. Uh, as a young man, uh, Dostoevsky was imprisoned. He was imprisoned uh, because he participated in socialist study circles. And first, he was sentenced in, uh, 1940, in 1849 to death by a firing squad. And when already tied to a wooden pole, his sentence was changed to hard labor in Siberia. And some of the characters of his novels comes from this hard labor experience. You can see that the delight for post-truth, for the right, delight for the absurd dramas has been part of the Russian society for a very long time. Dostoevsky later experienced also the death of his wife and four children and was addicted to gambling and for this reason he lived in poverty. In his very long-winded novels, don't expect happy ends. But you can find very profound insights there. And it is interesting that uh, most of the theologians who were Russian refugees after the Russian Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, most of them returned in one way or another to Dostoevsky, who was their great teacher. 
and some of the puzzling quotes which further were related to beauty. The first example from Brothers Karamazov. Uh, this is said by Mitya, Dimitri, the oldest brother, who was uh, addicted to the life of pleasure. And yet life treated him the hardest way. Uh, Mitya, at one point, speaks about beauty, beauty that can be found also in Sodoma. Beauty, I can't endure the thought that a man of lofty mind and heart begins with the ideal of the Madonna and ends with the ideal of Sodom. What's still more awful is that a man with the ideal of Sodom in his soul does not renounce the ideal of the Madonna. I think the abuse of religion is nothing new in this time. Believe me that for the immense mass of mankind, beauty is found in Sodom. God and the devil are fighting there and the battlefield is the heart of man. The ambiguity of beauty. But this is not the only thing which Dostoevsky says. And the other quote which I'm going to use now is perhaps even more famous than the first one. It comes from uh, his novel, Idiot. And it is expressed in an indirect language. Hippolyte, which is one of the youth that uh, lies about being relative to Prince Mishkin, who is a Russian epileptic nobleman who returns from a sanatorium in Switzerland. Uh, in one of the conversation, puts it this way. Is it true, Prince, that you once declared that beauty would save the world? Don't blush, Prince, you make me sorry for you. What beauty saves the world? Kolya told me that you are a zealous Christian. Is it so? Dostoevsky identified with Mishkin. Not that he would be naive and childlike, but in his absurd life circumstances and absurd situation, God and Christianity spoke through the absurdity. The Son of God became incarnated amidst absurdity. And the beauty of salvation was of this kind. Mishkin, who was in love, indeed, with uh, Nastasia Filipovna, who was the beauty of their day. And she was a woman who was sexually abused as she was growing up as an orphan by her guardian. And this turned her brokenness into a mockery, as the novel keeps telling us. Uh, Mishkin, with the soul of a child, is convinced that if this woman would be loved selflessly by someone, that this could save her. The novel doesn't have a happy end, but there is a possibility. And this possibility is so vital for Dostoevsky that he manages to pass this on. And this has been one of the most frequently quoted insight. It's interesting that even Solzhenitsyn in his Nobel Prize lecture comes back to his quote. And he says that for many years he dismissed it. But only later he realized that this was a prophetic insight. Paul Yevdokimov sees the iconicity of beauty in Dostoevsky. But what is interesting that we find in Yevdokimov, who is an orthodox theologian, perhaps similar critique which we found also in Adorno and Levinas earlier on. When he speaks about icons, he says that the icon is the expression or likeness 
of what exists. So the relationship to reality is vital, whereas idol represents what does not exist. It's a fabrication, a sham. Icon is in no sense an incarnation or even a place, but a visible sign of radiant, invisible presence. How close to the experience of Tillich? The icon, in its very symbolism, arrives at the apophaticism of its own, suppressing illustration. And again here, this would be something which would be very close to Levinas. It refuses reifying the transcendent. Liberation is coming close. Concluding remarks. As I open the conference, I hope that some of these questions will come to fore during some of the mon more competent talks on the theme. There are different desires aroused by the aesthetical experience, holy and unholy. And in them, beauty comes as a riddle. There is much beauty found in Sodom, says Dostoevsky. There can be beauty of crime, even beauty of war. But is that beauty or is that aesthetics? And I don't mean just juggling with concepts here, but what are we dealing with? In theology, of course, there is a danger of projecting aesthetics of the cross, of suffering, of obedience, that could be equally idolatrous. But we don't speak about that idolatry often enough, I think. We only encounter the effects of idolatry when we meet people who were harmed by these concepts and practices. Beauty is both more primordial and it transcends aesthetics. This is one of the propositions I would want to make. Beauty rather than aesthetics is related to all Christian mysteries, beginning with creation that is found beautiful, to redemption and deification, testifying something of the divine source of all things. Beauty mediates vital joy and spiritual truth. And if theology loses joy, then I think that we should lose theology. Beauty can speak even when desires for the good, for truth and justice are frustrated. And yet it does not replace them. It leads back to them through a different door. Thank you for your attention. This good? Yeah? Perfect. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you once more for the possibility to be here and to speak. Instead of giving a lecture, I think that this introduction can be seen more as a few somewhat unsystematic remarks. I have no PowerPoint, no pictures. Maybe I'm following the Jewish tradition. No. Uh, remarks, my remarks, which I have decided to base on my own experience rather than on the literature, and which I hope will be at least slightly inspiring for you. However, in this introduction, I have to mention Umberto Eco, Eco, and his novels and academic work on the theme of beauty and ugliness, not only because he was born 90 years ago, 
but because he became a popular author in the Czech Republic, partly thanks to his novel entitled The Prague Cemetery. Ivana wanted me to say something about the relationship between beauty and history. And it is true that beauty, like everything else under the sky, is a historical category. We can talk about and reflect on the, uh, on the idea of beauty during different historical periods, about the lives of artists and the history of their work, and about the changes to our objective or subjective understanding of beauty. Or we might discuss the concept of female beauty, for example, fashion, and how we have decorated our bodies in different periods. On the other hand, I cannot help mention a certain difficulty or contradiction. If I were to talk about beauty outside of the university department, here, I would probably talk about it differently, perhaps as a reflection of something permanent which can't be squeezed into historical or even anthropological categories, as a reflection of beauty which comes into our world from somewhere else. The words fail me here because beauty requires experience and a certain kind of surrender which defies analysis. So, but I promise uh, that I would talk and not remain silent. And so I would like to consider the relationship between beauty and three historical concepts, which I consider to be fundamental. And these are time, space, and the historical imagination. It is impossible to think historically without time and space, and without imagination, a work of history becomes just a collection of data. So firstly then, beauty and time. I have found memories of reading Eric Maria Remarque's books when I was young. And there was a particularly interesting story in one of them. During the First World War, the main character had to hide in a cellar to avoid being captured and killed. And by chance, his hideaway was an art gallery depository. Over the months, if not years, he therefore had the opportunity not only to look at the paintings, but to examine them, meditate over them, and be swept away by them. He discovered that each painting needed time. Here I thought of a well-known passage from the Gospel of the transfiguration on the mountain. Let us stay here, says Peter to Jesus. It is good here. It is beautiful here. We like it here. Let us savor this moment. Let's not go back to that cruel world. Let us put up our tents and remain here. Just as he says this, Jesus brings him back to the world. Jesus speeds up time. He obviously loves beauty, but he doesn't have time for it. In human creation, in art, 
it is obvious that time is needed. Not only do we need time to create art, but we also need time to appreciate it. If I had to be specific, then the things with Batch explains what I am talking about is that historical event par excellence, the liturgical, uh, liturgical year. This seems to me to be a fantastic combination of cyclical and linear time, the combination of natural, religious, religious and cult cultural cycles. It is the kind of environment in which stereotypes and the possibility of creativity are present at the same time. It is a concentration which becomes demanding, time consuming and mentally challenging during the most crucial moments. The Easter liturgy take, uh, take, takes you to the boundaries of what is possible, time seems to stop, while it is also intensified and expanded within the framework of remembrances, memories. It is little wonder that celebrations and holidays are amongst the most, in, most interesting things that history and anthropology explore. For example, it is not at all strange uh, that the French Revolution not only ushered in new ideas about men and society, but it also attempted to introduce a new calendar which can be seen as liturgical, secular or secularized. Although the French revolutionaries wanted to do away with Christianity, they couldn't get rid of the celebration that uplift the soul. Incidentally, their efforts tell us much about their overconfidence. Secondly, beauty and space. Here I understand space to mean a room, a region, a city, a country, but also nature. Uh, beauty requires a place, a boundary, a limit. The boundary might be just a wire or a, a wall, but it could also be the human body, demarcated from its surrounding, surroundings as is the case for every creature. What strikes historians at first glance are the disputes surrounding the beauty of modernity versus the beauty of antiquity. There is probably no controversy over whether a pre or a leopard is beautiful. But why talk about the beauty of an aeroplane, a broken machine, or let's say a modern state? As modern art history teaches us, this is a long running argument in which the conservative seems to have definitely lost. And uh, the evidence for this is in the world's galleries. However, I want to look at another example of space and again an archetypal one. Here I am thinking of the concept of paradise, which in our imagination is also a kind of enclosed space containing beautiful things and relationships. In the modern world, paradise is not merely the remembering of a golden past, where the, the first age was golden, but something which can occur, can occur or be established in the present and the future. My teaching 
focuses a great deal on the 19th century and it increasingly seems to me that it is a century of dozens, if not, if not hundreds, of attempts to elaborate on the realization of a future paradise. This might be through the introduction of equality among people or through the scientific management of society or through some form or of predictable progress which will lead to a paradise on earth. It is as if people in Europe in particular were intoxic intoxicated or unchanged by the chance to visualize and imagine utopian paradis paradisical projects. Here rationality mixes with a dreamlike world you are all from different countries, so um, I don't know if you uh, learned about the Czech national revival or, or um, the processes with which European ethnic groups went through. Perhaps it might interest you to know that in our national anthem, uh, which is a very valuable symbol of our national identity, we think about an earthly paradise to behold. Here beauty is not only connected to the borders of a country and the nature to be found there, but also with national slavonic qualities. Unlike Germans, the Slavs are dove-like in character and which plans which we have for our country despite our enemies. Paradise is a place where dreams come true. We can truly realize our potential and be ourselves there. I even think that this is true to an extent of such a national state contains liberal elements and the rule of law, but then we are moving beyond the paradise project. Any interpretations of paradise obviously need to include the garden, which is a major environmental issue. In a relation, uh, a relation to this, I would only remind us of the crucial influence of free English of the English garden at the start of the modern age and the romantic understanding of the landscape being left to its own devices. And then uh, thirdly to top it all is the imagination. In this regard, history does not pretend to be a scientific discipline not only because it is not based on general laws, but it depends on traces from the past in order to reconstruct it. At the same time, I would mention a double imagination. The first focuses on the analysis of documents. The historian has to imagine what might be missing from the documents. As the hunt, a hunter is following an animal and the tracks get lost in the snow. Even a hunter has to know the context in order to continue his hunt. I understand the second imagination to mean constructing a story creation in the sense of writing a text. There is room here for beauty for the historian in the sense of proportionality, the choice of language and style, words and metaphors. It is not only about the historian uncovering the truth about our past 
and countering false information and stereotypes. It is also about beautiful presentation. In this respect, history is more of, the, uh, of a humanities discipline than a social science, even though these boundaries are blurred today. Unfortunately, historians now are losing the ability to tell a story. And if someone happens to be very good at it, such as Neil Ferguson, for example, then they are accused of merely being a capable popularizer. In this sense, I am thinking about the ability to tell a story in a gripping and beautiful way. Here, the postmodern idea concerning the end of great narratives has had a devastating effect and which, strangely enough, has been taken to heart more by historians than novelists. They failed to recognize that the great narratives which had ambitiously attempted to grasp history in its entire entirety had come to an end. Karl Marx and August Comte, for example, can no longer be teachers for historians. Balzac, Zola, and Tolstoy, maybe Dostoevsky, have more to say about people and the uh, environments they inhabit. Beautiful fiction, as it is known in Czech rather than just plain old fiction, can be greatly inspiring for, for history. So, uh, in the end of this short introduction, I would like to add that I consider beauty to be a neglected category. I believe that the modern era has produced uh, an excess of projects based on rationality and utopian projects which were understood in revo revolutionary rather than evolutionary terms. I see this situation as dangerous for the survival of beauty, which needs time, perseverance, room, reflection, and even meditation. It would seem that only a romanticism and the movements linked to it were able to stop and marvel at beauty. However, it was so full of, of contradictions that in the 20th century it transformed in the, into a militari militarized ideology or nostalgic kitsch. Beauty is still waiting to be accepted and appreciated. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jiří. And now I would like to give space to Annemarie Freinen, a professor of ecumenical theology from Institut Catholique in Paris. Uh, Annemarie has uh, done uh, work in uh, many different fields which are interdisciplinary. And uh, one of the fields which she has worked also was astrobiology. Uh, that uh, in combination with theology, I am sure would be big enrichment. So, Anne-Marie, would you like to sit here, please? Um, I did share beforehand uh, a little clip, um, which I think may now appear.
So thank you very much. I am being put in an extremely uh, uh, difficult, uh, but of course gratifying spot. I'm very help, uh, happy to do this, but um, I have to respond to uh, so much, such a wealth of um, information and thoughts um, that in fact I will weave it into the fabric of a few remarks I have prepared and um, I will start with um, proposing I have two theses the first thesis is cosmological and it is one that stresses harmony, structure, order, symmetry, which together make up probably classical beauty. The second thesis is Christological and it is under the sign of paradox. I call it the beauty of ugliness. Because of my own Protestant background, which tends to give much more emphasis to the theology of the cross and the paradox, it is uh, helpful for me personally to, to, um, to give more emphasis to the first cosmological thesis because of the tradition of what we call cosmos vergessenheit. So, correlating structures of the outer world with structures of the human mind. This I also address to the neurologist. Um, binary, ternary, harmony, the harmony of the golden number, proportion, symmetry. So in this first thesis, I want to vindicate an intuition about continuity between, on the one hand, the anthropological given of the three dimensions of existence, the body, the mind, and the soul, and this triad of dimensions can also be brought back to a binary of two dimensions, the body and the spirit, which in that case, the spirit is the mind and the soul also. So that is a more simple structure, um, uh, mind and body. Mind the gap, I would say. And, and so those are binary and ternary structures that seem to be fundamental. And it is my thesis that they correspond with structures in the pre-existing world, in the non-built environment, in the cosmos that is not human, but that precedes and bypasses and exceeds human civilization. The twofold of night and day, left and right, and also the threefold of so-called realms, mineral, vegetable, animal, the three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. And in this thesis, beauty lies in the symmetry of two, found in the two hemisphere of the brain, and also in the two pairs of limbs in the human body and in the bodies of many mammals, two pairs of limbs, uh, in the structure of three, which seems to be universal. So this pulse, what I call a pulse, a rhythm, a beat of two and three might constitute the very pulse of life, not only human constructions and time history. What belongs to the pulse of life is death and life, or death 
life decay and new life. And I'm reminded of, um, this is the kind of exegesis one should not do too often, <laughs> at least when you teach biblical exegesis, but I'm reminded of, of Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered in my name. I am there. Two or three. Raymond Panikar was fully Christian, Roman Catholic, and at the same time fully Hindu. He was both Catalan and Indian. And he is the one theologian, to my knowledge, who gives a substantial account of what I have called the pulse beat, the rhythm of life. In his Gifford lectures, he shows the rhythm of being. In a short book, Trinity, the Religious ex uh, Experience of, of uh, Man, um, the Trinity becomes not an abstruse doctrine reserved for a handful of insiders. It is not esoteric, but exoteric, because according to Raymond Panikar, it is found outside in the natural world. The triad thus is a cultural invariant that has also vestiges in the creation. Not an idea that's very popular among Protestant theologians. I have uh, checked. So among Protestant theologians, Paul Tillich, already presented by Ivana Noble, um, Paul Tillich is one of the few to perceive this importance of numbers of two and three in a text of 1928 called Nature and Sacrament. Human beings have a consensus that was very clear in both your papers, a consensus throughout time and space about what constitutes beauty, the classical beauty, harmony of proportions in architecture, in living forms, in the golden number, which is even why we find a pleasing face a pleasing face. Structure such as binary, ternary, trinitarian. But in this cosmological thesis, you will notice that beauty is not limited to aesthetics, nor to the fabrication of beautiful artifacts, history of art, beauty as history of art. The, because in my thesis, at least, the anthropological category is embedded in a world which is both shaped by human craft and the non-human world and its beauty. Beauty is found on our scale, but the human being is not the measure of everything. The Greek word cosmos carries the meaning of the meaning beauty and order. So the program that lies before us and ahead is so enticing and rich, almost overwhelming in its diversity, that to ask for yet one more perspective might seem excessive. But what I find lacking, or at least what I miss in reading the program, is the mind-boggling dimensions of the visible universe, as we are more and more able to perceive its structures and as our tools explore the galaxies and the black holes in our galaxy. Cosmology does not take us away from the anthropological questions of this colloquium if, as I believe, there is a relation between the inner space of consciousness and the outer space of the cosmos. 
it so happens that there's a word that covers both deep space. Deep space is the depth of our inner being shaped by layer upon layer of history, of the great works of art, of our own dreams, desires of generations before us, call them archetypes. And deep space is also the physical realm of space beyond the first circle of outer space that surrounds the third planet, our island home, according to the Book of Common Prayer. NASA's definition of deep space is as follows. The space beyond the low Earth orbit and cislunar space onto Mars, for example. Now, how can we draw this analogy between our inner deep space and the external deep space? Since we are smaller than fleas on a pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan famously called Earth. Now, the answer lies in the richness and complexity of the human brain. In that sense, outer space corresponds to inner space. And one argument for this analogy is the number of neurons, neuronal cells, and the connections between these cells called synapses. That number is absolutely staggering. Estimates vary, but I have seen around 100 billion neurons, even after COVID, because COVID takes away 10% of your IQ in some cases. I have not yet had it. <laughs> some estimates also talk about a mere 86 billion. And the synapses, the connections that are made between the cells in the brain, that number is a staggering, or staggering is not even sufficient, um, 1,000 trillion synapses. So there would be half as many neurons in your brain as there are stars in the Milky Way which seems to, to validate the ancient intuition of the connection between macrocosmos and microcosmos. But it is not all about quantities, about numbers and their beauty. The ethical quality is the one that allows us to speak for the human singularity. And uh, that was really beautiful, the quote, uh, given by, by Ivana of uh, Evdokimov and the, the Septuagint translation. So instead of um, good, read uh, beautiful. The heavyweight English mathematician and philosopher Frank Ramsey, who was the brother of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael Ramsey, responds in following fashion to the famous terror of Blaise Pascal about the vastness of outer space. He still called it space. For him, it was space. And so the silence of those infinite spaces freezes Blaise Pascal. And Frank Ramsey says, quote, where I seem to differ from some of my friends is in attaching little importance to size. I don't feel in the least humble before the vastness of the heavens. The stars may be large, but they cannot think or love. And these are the qualities which impress me far more than size does. I, Frank Ramsey, 
take no credit for weighing nearly 17 stone. I don't know that imperial measure, but Tim is probably the only one who can tell us it's a lot. It's big, 17 stone. <laughs> but Ramsey says, I take no credit for that. The foreground is occupied by human beings and the stars are as small as three penny bits. So this is not Billy Graham speaking. It's, and as a theologian, one would also probably not dare speak like that. It's a mathematician and an astronomer. So end of quote. A cosmic sense of beauty, beauty as structure, and the un incommensurable, the immense, flows more freely from the Greek source of our culture than from the biblical source. In the wisdom tradition, we can discover powerful expressions of the continuity, now understood as the relatedness of beauty and goodness. That is very much a wisdom um, connection. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech and night unto night reveals knowledge. That was, of course, Psalm 19. Augustine is the classical writer in this regard, as in so many other regards, I find always. One always goes back to Augustine, at least I do. So Augustine in De Libero Abitrio says, quote, observe the heavens above and the bright things that shine there, observe the earth below and the sea and all the things which walk, fly, or swim therein, they have forms because they have numbers. Take these away and they will be as nothing. Beauty and goodness converge in God as God reveals God's own creation and also in us because we are called to be in God's image and resemblance. And here I have another quote from Evdokimov from the same book, The Art of the Icon. So quote from Evdokimov, the power of divine love contains the universe and from chaos made it in the cosmos that is beauty. Every living thing reaches out and rises up toward the sun of divine beauty. Woman is created with a hunger for the beautiful. She is that very hunger. She is that very hunger as image of God and being of God's race." End of quote. So in the first cosmological thesis on beauty and the human, we show an innate movement towards beauty. It is on the side of nature and not only on the side of nurture in the famous dialectic between nature and nurture. Nowadays, because we live with computers and become like computers, we say it is hardwired. It is not only software. We are hardwired to seek beauty and to see patterns, to discover patterns like symmetry. We are in this quest for beauty, not restricted to human beings. The boundaries between non-human and human animals are no longer an iron curtain within limits. Now, th those limits would be, of course, another colloquium. <laughs> so, 
certainly there is a circulation between the plant kingdom and the realm of animals. Indeed, not every shape, pattern, color can be explained away in Darwinian terms. Now, don't take this to be a, uh, a rejection or a denial, of course, of, of Darwin's uh, theory. It is just that even from a botanical, biological point of view, there is an enigma in the proliferation of forms of beauty in plants. So our friends, biologists now speak of representation. And it's not all about reproduction. There is a, a mystery there, uh, which of course can be more, I wouldn't say easily explained, but more readily explained if you think uh, of uh, creation as a doxology, as a praise. God is like the woman in the novel by Doris Lessing, if I remember correctly, who makes clothes for herself with gorgeous but invisible linings, tucked away shells in a hem, beautiful, minute stitchings, in a way, Ars gratia artis, art for art's sake. And um, to only quote the end of that uh, poem by, uh, by Gerard Manley Hopkins, um, Piot Beauty, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change, praise him. My second thesis is shorter. I have no idea of how much time I still have. So, two, second thesis, paradox. The beauty of logic, of numbers, of symmetry and order do have, does have a, um, an advantage because it provides a language which is universal. So, my first thesis that I have just maybe a bit lengthily developed, is a bridge. It's a principle of epistemological continuity between, for instance, on the one hand, neurology, and on the other hand, mathematics. The language of numbers, which conveys beauty, functions as a bridge between disciplines. And this kind of beauty is also found in scriptures, especially in the wisdom traditions. Now, there is such a strong strain of estrangement from the cosmos in my own Protestant tradition that I have felt compelled to state that first cosmological thesis rather emphatically. My second thesis does not cancel the first, but it is indispensable. And here we speak of paradox, of discontinuity, of interruption. Whereas in the realm of natural sciences, um, the key working tool is predictability. When you are on the grounds of paradox, you leave that predictability. As Paul wrote to his sisters and brothers gathered in the town of Corinth, quote, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God, through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. So there's wisdom and there is folly and they both come out of the hand of God. God still walks in God's garden in the paradise, 
but we have to live in a world whose beauty is distorted as the people living here in Fortna, evacuees from the brutal Ukraine war, remind us. Bruno Forti offers some lucid interpretations of Dostoevsky and Balthazar in a little book called The Portal of Beauty. And I know that Geisha Thiessen at least has read it because she wrote a blurb. Starting naturally for a Roman Catholic, such as Bruno Forte, with Thomas Aquinas, whose, quote, approach to beauty brings together both Greek thought in its preoccupation with holding the multiplicity of realities together in the well-ordered depth of the one by the analogy of form, analogy of form, and the Judeo-Christian tradition with its faith in the living God who breaks into history like a consuming fire or a light shining in the darkness. So the difference there between classical beauty as form and Christological beauty as splendor as erupting light. And I have singled out Chagall's interpretation of the burning bush, which you might see um, soon. The second thesis points us toward tragic beauty. At first sight, the cross overturns all expectations. We leave behind us order predictability and, harm and harmony. Something or someone breaks in. The passion is Einbruch, as Paul Tillich liked to call it, Einbruch, perplexing. And indeed, how beauty will save the world seems perplexing. This quote was not prepared together, the three of us. It was, um, it's classical when Hippolyte in Dostoevsky's Idiot asks, what sort of beauty will save the world? What sort of beauty? What are we looking for? And as Bruno Forte writes in The Portal of Beauty, the beauty that, wills, that will save the world is revealed and at work in the sign of its opposite. And I concede to Ivana that there has been a morbid fascination with suffering. There has been the doloristic tradition in all Christian confessions. But the cross, properly understood as scandalon, supposes the brokenness and not the worship of the brokenness. It is a scandal because you have a body that is broken and that body was a mother's child, as is every child on this earth. So let us dwell for a moment with this peculiar moment, which is the foundation of Christian faith. Hans Urs von Balthasar sketches a theological anthropology by depicting the dereliction of the Logos. The kenosis is a silencing, which for a Logos is, you know, it's really, that's bad luck. I mean, that's really, that's more than bad luck. It's tragic. You're a Logos, and there you are, silenced. You are a body incarnate, and you are empty it. Kenosis. So, those are not the words of von Balthasar, who puts it much better. Quote, God's word in the world has fallen silent. He does not even ask in the night for God. He is laid out in the ground. The night that arches above him is no night of stars. It is the silence of absence. 
beauty and goodness are crucified in the sense indeed of Martin Luther's theology of the cross, whereby God is paradoxically better known in the ugliness of pain than in the glory of the morning sky and the blossoms of a spring day. Yet the word who was incarnate in Christ was and is and will be the same word that enlightens all who come into this world. Thank you for your attention.